right, it looks like we have started. So um, I just want to introduce myself. Uh, I'm David Tanner. I am the Dean for Arts and Cultural Resources here at Albright. Uh, and that includes, of course, the Center for the Arts and the Friedman Gallery. Um, I just want to welcome everyone. I know we've got about 50 folks um, that are part of our audience today. So thank you all for joining mm -hmm. us. Um, I also want to thank, of course, our artist and guest of honor, um, Renal Parikh is with us. So hello, Renal. Thank you for Hi, joining how are you? us. Thank you for sharing your work. We'll take a closer look at that here uh, as we go through the presentation today. Um, also on our panel is our guest essayist, Shilpi Chandra. I want to thank you for joining us. Hi, Shilpi. Um, I also would be remiss if I didn't thank a few other folks here at the beginning. Um, that includes our visual arts committee members who help us plan our season of events, um, our gallery attendants, um, and then several folks here in the CFA that are on um, our staff. That includes Stephen Nicodemus and our intern, John um, Villano, who's running today's session behind the scenes. Thank you guys both for setting all of this up. Um, also, Heather Hoff, our administrative assistant, who really keeps us all organized and flowing and all the work going. Um, also want to thank Rich Hauk, um, who was instrumental. He's our um, uh, preparator. So he was instrumental in collecting the work from Renal, um, installing it in the gallery. So thank, thanks to uh, Rich. Um, thanks also to Kate Mishricki, who's our registrar. Um, she handles all of the loan paperwork, things like that. Um, I want to give a couple of... Um, Thanks to folks in other departments. That includes um, Heidi Ekman and Carrie Manzalillo. Those are two uh, of our colleagues over in communications. And um, Carrie helps with proofreading all of our work. And Heidi does incredible designs. And if you haven't seen a copy of this yet, let's see if I can make you focus on that. Ooh, my blurring background is all crazy right now. Um, you definitely want to get a copy of this. This is um, the trifold for Renal's. Uh, exhibition. Um, it includes the essay that uh, Shilpi Chandra wrote for us. So again, thank you for that. Um, there are also some beautiful images, and you're going to see those here in a second. Uh, but uh, Heidi designed that, and I want to thank her for that. I also want to thank um, Mike and all of the, the crew in catering. Um, they are going to um, uh, be catering our reception that happens this Thursday. That's the closing reception for Renal's exhibit. Uh, so Mike and the setups team uh, uh, Mikey and George, everyone who um, helps make that event successful, I want to just say a uh, preemptive thank you as well. Um, also, um, again, I just mentioned that we do have a closing reception. That's this Thursday, 10-6 uh, from 5 to 7, so October 6th, 5 to 7. Um, both Renal as well as Leah Francis, who also has uh, an exhibition that will be closing, will be here for that. So that'll be your chance to meet these two amazing artists in person. We heard from Leah um, about a month ago about her work, uh, and they will both be joining us um, uh, here at the end of the um, exhibition run for both of their exhibitions. Um, that will be followed, that event will be followed by a keynote presentation that kicks off our Empowering Albright Voices Days. Um, that keynote will be delivered by Dr. Patrice Rankin. Uh, and so I hope you'll join us in the theater at 7 p.m. on Thursday night for that, as well as a full day of activities on Friday um, to, that celebrate the diversity um, here at Albright College. <clears throat> a few other announcements. Um, the other exhibition that is in the gallery is um, an exhibition of prints that uh, celebrate the legacy of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So if you haven't seen that, you have a little bit longer. Um, that exhibit closes in, on the 14th of October. Um, so I encourage you to come out and see that. Um, also, once all of these exhibitions close, we'll have two new exhibitions in our project space. Um, we'll have work by Dominic Lombardi. Um, he is a, a celebrated um, artist, but also educator, uh, a critic, and a curator. Um, his work uh, specifically for this show is called Cross Contamination and includes some of his older works, um, drawings, paintings, sculptures um, that he has contaminated, if you will, um, by uh, stickers that he has drawn and then um, placed strategically on those works. So I'm really excited to see those um, new collages that he's created. Um, and then also Benefit Print Project 
is sharing their archival collection with us. They're a gallery based in New York. Um, they work with a number of um, celebrated artists, um, folks like William Kentridge, Fred Eversley, um, Linda Bangless, um, and they will be um, uh, installing work in our gallery um, that includes all of these projects that they've done with these artists. Uh, and that also includes their most um, recent collaboration. Uh, so do come out and uh, uh, see work by Tim Hawkins as well. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, that will, both of those shows will open towards the end of October. Um, and then finally, we have um, a couple of other CFA events that I just wanna draw your attention to. Um, beyond Friday, there are a couple of events that are part of um, Empowering Albright Voices. That includes on Friday, the International Fashion Show. Um, that'll take place at 5 p.m. in um, uh, the chapel on campus. Um, it'll be outside in front of the chapel if weather permits, and if not, it'll move indoors. And then the following night on Saturday um, at 7.30 p.m. in the chapel, we'll have the first choral concert of the season. That's Sounds of Nature. Um, that is an experience event. Many of the um, EAV events are also experience events. You can check all of that out on our website. Um, just search Empowering All Bright Voices, and that'll bring up the whole list of activities for you for that day. Okay, so after all of that, um, let us turn our attention back to um, the reason we're here, and that is to delve a little bit deeper into the work um, of Renal Parek. Um, and so again, I just want to thank you, Renal, for joining us today. Thank you so much for sharing your beautiful work, which I have been following on Instagram for a very long time. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to share it with everyone else. Um, as we go through, I have some questions for you. We are going to um, uh, save some time at the end for folks to uh, ask questions as well. Um, but as we go through, um, we'll get to know you a little bit better. Um, I'll let you introduce um, different aspects of your life because I think that's central to your work. So I don't wanna spoil anything um, quite yet. Um, but if folks do have questions, um, they can pop them up into the, the Q&A or the chat. Um, and John and Stephen are monitoring that and we'll get to those questions um, at the end as well. All right? All right. Awesome. awesome. Um, so I would, um, like to, <laughs> I would like to start with, uh, you know, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for letting me exhibit my work at the Albright College. I wanted to thank um, you, the whole team, Shilpi and everyone who is here and who came out to see my show and been following me on Instagram. Um, thank you so much. It means so much to me and I'm excited to talk about some really nitty gritty about my work. All right. Awesome. awesome. That sounds great. We are delighted to, to have your work here and um, I've just heard nothing but positive comments about it. So this should be good. Um, and certainly, um, she'll be, if there are things that you would like to speak to um, with some of these questions, we encourage you to, to hop in there as well. That's why we've invited you today. So we're going to start with our first question for Renal. Um, and as we go through, um, we will be bringing up some images. Um, so I'll share my screen and bring up some of these images that she'll talk about. But the first question really is about you. Um, so before your focus as a visual artist, you had another very successful career. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that and particularly how the elements of that discipline have informed your creative practice? Um, yes. Um, so I have my uh, formal education in biochemistry. I worked in India as a biochemist. I came to the United States in 2005 and I started working at Penn Presbyterian Hospital as a biochemist and at that time, I was also um, in Drexel getting my master's towards PhD in molecular biology. So yes, uh, biochemistry is my formal training and background. And um, I, I still enjoy it. I'm full-time professional artist now, but I still love to stay current by reading and you know, getting a, to learn about the new ounces and the development in the field. Um, I, I feel... I feel I'm very blessed that I have that educational background in biochemistry. And the reason is um, the, the biochemistry field is all about um, structure, bonding, uh, functions, and interaction be between the cells 
with their environment through different chemical reactions and how you know the cells harness those energy at the macro level. I feel like I see that resemblance in my work to so many extent. Like when I'm painting that education, that structural training always instinctively makes me think about that balancing between my models where the birds and animals versus my background. Even though they are so different, I'm always trying to find that connection, that interaction, and somehow they both can coexist. And same thing with the colors too. It's always, for me, everything is about balance and harmony. It is busy, but it is not. It still has a focal point. It is um, you know, very colorful, but still it stands on its own. Uh, whereas my monochromatic paintings of Arlie's are two tonal, but still there's so much interactions happening between the characters. And that's what I feel it is because of my educational training. And you know, it helps me see things at that macro level, like small things, like the small moments, those things that get lost is what I try to bring alive through my paintings. That's great. Yeah. Um, I definitely think that explains a lot for me looking, having studied your paintings now um, for several weeks. Um, one of the things that uh, that your answer really reinforces for me is the the use of repetition in your work as well um, with that design element, mm -hmm. uh, um, all of that. So I, I, um, I think that that has served you well to have that background and to yeah. really bring that into the <laughs> artwork. It's, it's a beautiful aspect of that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, our second question, and, and we'll pull up some images here, um, uh, is this. So our guest essayist, um, Shilpi Chandra, has written about your uh, new body of work that's on display in the Freedmen and how it was informed by Indian folk painting traditions um, but it also departs from those traditions. So if you could tell us a little bit about those influences and where those departure points are for you. So first of all, thank you, Shilpi, for a beautiful narration of this new uh, body of work that I created for this, sh this show specifically. Thank you. It is lovely. Um, so um, the collection that I brought to Albright College is all about fun and joy and happiness uh, that is deeply seated uh, for me emotionally. And that's what the whole collection is about. And um, I use three styles of painting to portray that. And I, they are very close to me for several other, um, reasons. And one of them is um, like specifically like Warley's. Warley's are all about storytelling. It's a woman's, uh, mainly women painted them to decorate their houses. It has a community aspect to it. Um, as a, a, just like a book clubs here, like women get together in the afternoon and decorates and it's, it's a temporary mural. Um, also it talks about the surrounding and everything they see and enjoy around them and that, to me resonates so much. It's what I took from that specific style is um, you don't have to go places to find those happy moments. They are here. It's, it's right in front of you. Like, and you want to enjoy them. You want to cherish them. You want to appreciate them. And that's what my Warley painting has always been, is about the small things. The very small, like, and the way I start is with the subjects. The subjects are also very small, like, you know, like rain or fall. You know, it's not big, it's small. It's right there in front of you. You see them every day. Sometimes you appreciate, sometimes you don't. Like, it's raining right now, and I'm sure a lot of people are not happy. <laughs> but at the same time, but like it's it's a small thing. It's right here in front of your eyes, and that's what Warley uh, means to me, and that's what I portray my subjects through them. They are more an emotional paintings for me that I love, 
and um, being monochromatic, it is. The stories are so colorful. You want to enjoy those stories and subjects rather than the color. And that's why they are monochromatic. And the, the first one I want to talk to you about is uh, my uh, home. The painting is about the tree. And in most of my varleys, the central motive has everything is around a tree. And that is because to me, tree resembles home. Everything and like for everything you come to home, you're happy, you come home. You're sad, you want to go home. You know, like celebration, everything is home. And to me, the tree signifies that. It, it means um, every time I see the tree, it feels the same thing. And this particular piece is very interesting and important to me because it's called home. And it, the painting is about the tree and water, but um, it also signifies a little something about me enjoying my kids. Like here, you can see some monkeys. Now, monkeys means what? Monkeys means uh, connection to nature, right? They are uh, the closest thing the human has, but they also serves um, constant amusement, joy, happiness, careless, silly and sociable, energetic. It has so much to offer. And when I see my kids, it is like that. In my home, we have I have two boys and they're like monkey, they're energetic, they're running. It makes me, um, it tells me to not take things seriously, like stop and enjoy and appreciate what's around. And the birds is, in all my painting, birds signifies the joy and the happiness that we put out and it also signifies the joy and happiness that bring is brought in from our society from our culture from our surroundings so this is home and those energy goes out and the positive energy comes in and it's all about happiness the the strong bond of family and um enthusiasm and tranquility and vividity and everything associated with the home. It's where I feel more, most peaceful. And that was the central motive of this piece, which I try to portray with the trees and monkeys. And, and you know, you can see there are a lot of different poses of monkey. They're playing around, they're climbing on me. And, you know, it, that's what my kids did with us. And I'm sure that, you know, you did with your parents and you will have so much when you see that you will start seeing the resemblance of your childhood in those things. And that's what the, the painting is about. The other one I would like to share is called Sunrise. Now, as I said, all my painting has some deeply seated emotions embedded on this painting. And again, the central motive is tree and it's called sunshine and the rays are coming out of trees along with the birds. And um, it was motivated from sunrise and especially early morning sun when it is behind the tree and you can see that white rays falling on the ground and the birds are ready to come out. And um, the way I thought was the, the thought process behind those that, that specific piece was it is shine through, right? The sun is shining through. And that's why the rays are coming behind the tree. The birds to me are, again, it's the same thing as the joy that goes out in the world. We are there. We are you know, spreading and sharing our energy and positivity with the world. And that's what, um, here it's the same motive, but it is portrayed in a different format and, you know, makes, uh, the inspiration was early morning, morning and the trees. So again, it's it's the bar, like the barley is still there. It's it's the the meaning of the barley is still there. It is to, you know, see things which are right in front of you. Yes, Shilpi, I think Shilpi has a question. <clears throat> so in my research with barley painting, um, and the question that David asked about sort of the point of departure between Reynolds' work and, and traditional painting, um, I, I'm amazed by the, 
by how Renal is able to give the sense of movement to her paintings, even though you have very sort of fixed, unmoving, rooted um, subject matter like trees, um, you know, that you don't think of. But the way she has the, um, the birds sort of coming towards the trees, and even the leaves have um, often have this sense of movement, which is um, quite different than what you would see in traditional paintings, which are generally, you know, um, scenes of a particular time. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's it's really um, you know amazing to me how the sense of movement is really is conveyed um, through Reynolds' um, the, uh, process, painting process. Thank you, Shilpi. Um, the same thing is with the uh, another painting of mine is April shower. Now, it is a very common subject. I'm April showers, May flowers. We have heard that million times and yes, April it rains, um, you know, the things blossom. And to me, it is it's such a beautiful moment, right? Um, the spring is here, it flowers, it, the trees looks beautiful, but when it rains, that tree looks so much different. It has the beauty of its own. Flower, no flower is just, it becomes alive. And that's what is the April shower. And again, the same thing is, it's right in front of you. It's, it's not anywhere. And here I took, um, the birds are all coming in for shelter. And again, the, the deep seated tree being home is for the protection to, you know, avoid the, the situation, they all come to rest in the tree. And that's what the tree, again, it's the same thing. It, to me, it, it means the, the home, it means the center of everything. And here you can see with the, the painting. Yeah. The other one um, I really enjoy is Soarin. And this is, this is an interesting take on my Varley painting. Um, this painting is about, it's called Sorin. Um, it looks like a peacock feather. A lot of people told me about that. Like it looks like a feather peacock. It looks like a rainbow. And yes, it is a rainbow, but the, the way uh, the painting was uh, created was um, we have a train station close by and um, we have a lot of trees in our backyard and animal preserve are very close to my house. So we have a lot of birds, you know, around as well. So every time the train goes by, the birds shoots out. And to me, it represented, uh, a it gave me a sense of liberation. It gave me a sense of strength. It, it gave me a sense of happiness. And, you know, the joy just, you know, shooting out. And like, again, I feel like Warley is the only style which lets you talk about the emotion in in such a unique way where you see and you know this was my emotions but when you see it it can be your unique emotions through them because it's it's very plain I feel like there is no colors it it is asking you as a viewer to add your own color and take to the style and that's why I love traditional Warley. And I like the concept of the Warley, but I love to portray my moods and feelings through those paintings. Um, about um, other one that, um, the other two styles that I practice is called Kalamkaris and Warleys. Kalamkari is um, very um, constructed color palettes. It's only four or five colors, the main colors being black and the negative space is filled with red colors. And the style is all about fine lines and details and intricacy. Whereas Madhubani is very preliminary form of art, but it has no negative space and it is as colorful as it can be. I love to portray my birds and animal through this art, through this style. And, and the reason is Kalamkari lets, through the Kalamkari I make this, beautiful trees and flower patterns. Madhubani helps me create the most busy, vibrant surrounding in which my almost realistic looking birds and animal lives. And the, the, the way I treat them is they are models in my studio and I'm 
putting a beautiful backdrop behind them and I'm doing a live sessions with them. Uh, and that's how this, this particular form of this two folk art comes and plays in my colorful paintings of birds and animals. And as you can see here, the, the trees and flowers and they are repetitive flowers, but they are very colorful. They're not realistic looking, they're all um, just the creative aspect of the flowers and leaves and colorful and it's busy and you know the trees are busy and the, then there's birds. So that's the one of my take on Madhubanis and Kalamkaris. And you will see that throughout my work where I use, uh, it's very decorative, very intricate, uh, very colorful backgrounds. Uh, with flowers and leaves and the birds and animals being my motive. Can can I just ask if if she'll be? I know you um also commented on these two styles as well in your essay. Um, if you want to add any departure points that you saw uh in in Renal's work um based on traditional forms of those two styles of uh, Kalamkari and Madhubani. So I think um. With uh, Renal's work, she actually um, looks to particular species, particular types of uh, birds, animals, and flowers. Um, you could probably actually recognize the different um, uh, animals, et cetera, even, and the flowers, that she, trees that she's representing. You could actually pinpoint you know, um, what they are. Whereas in folk, uh, uh, the Madhubani folk painting, it's more of a stylized version of what um, uh, of what the flowers, um, you know, in the area would be. So a flower would be, have five petals or six petals and it'd be frontal looking, uh, very flat um, with leaves that are like what, what, are, what you think of uh, as, as a leaf rather than and actually closely looking at what uh, a particular leaf of a particular flower uh, in nature would look like. Um, so whereas there's a lot of stylization with the Madhubani uh, depictions of actual uh, uh, animals, flowers, um, I think Real goes a step forward and actually looks to nature, looks to, to des describe what she's actually seeing um, and is true to nature in, in that way. Thank you for that. That's a great discussion. Yeah. Yeah. That is that is a great point, <laughs> which I didn't thought of. But yes, I do uh, look not closely, but I do look at the reference pictures and you know flowers and how I can you know portray in my way more again stylizing, but a little bit closer and realistic looking than how it would be in Madhubani's style. Yeah, the, here you can say the same thing. It is very um, stylized, uh, Kalamkari being predominant. Here you can see the fine lines and details uh, around the bird and, you know, the bird is in the realistic format. That's the koi. Again, it's, it's uh, this, the same thing is this, I took an essence of the style and try to portray my own birds and animals utilizing that. So you will see the reminiscence of that style. Here, the color is what I took from it. And, um, you know, the flowers and, you know, the, the brush strokes are very inspired by the folk art, but the subject matter and way I portray them is uh, very contemporary than what it would, you will normally see with this particular styles. Um, let me go ahead and ask our next question. Um, but before, I just wanted to share that um, one of the courses I teach in first year seminar, we've been looking uh, at um, all the exhibitions in the gallery and students have been writing on um, a work of their choice. And I will say this particular piece comes up quite a bit as the selection that-, that wow. folks yeah, yeah, really connected to this piece for some reason. So just wanted to share that. So um, our next question is, um, color I is- oh, well, I just wanted to comment on this piece um, in particular because the way, um, you know, lotus, the lotus flower is a very common symbol and, and an often used motif 
um, in India and folk painting, but the way uh, Renal has actually used the, the different, um, the flower in different stages of blossoming um, throughout the painting, you know, gives it again that, you know, that feeling that this is an actual pond where you actually have flowers that are, um, you know, spread out through, through the pond versus just having, you know, fully bloom uh, lotuses that are in full bloom, which is a much more accurate sort of representation yes. of, what a, of what a lotus is. So yeah. that, um, again, that gives it more of this like realistic feeling in this painting. Great point. Great point. Thank you. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about color. It's it's clearly important. Uh, it's an important aspect of your work, um, even in those um, Worley style paintings that you um, talked about at the beginning. So the black and white, um, there are some hints of color in a couple of those. Um, can you talk about how you achieve the beautiful color saturation, um, particularly in, in these um, that we refer to as uh, gouache paintings? Um, and um, uh, compare that to your use of black and white in the mixed media acrylics and oils that are on the canvases that we saw at the beginning. Sure. Um, that is a fantastic question, and I'm so excited to talk about that because I love colors, as you all know. But um, color, uh, the colors has a strong cultural influence. The color has very strong um, you know, behavioral mood um, effects on human being. And that's what um, inspires me to use the colors. Now about, let's talk about Warley. And yes, there are two tonal paintings, but um, there's a layers and layers of process. And uh, if you can share the piece, uh, Summer Fun with me. Yes. Um, so, as you can see, the, the base is brown and the paint, uh, the, the characters are painted with white acrylic. But let me, uh, the process that goes behind this painting is I create um, my base, in this case it's canvas, with uh, using a lot of textual element. So I put a lot of, there are oftentimes there is cloth, there is different gradation of sands, glass beads, there is hay, to create that, um, you know, rough terrain. And uh, the other reason for that is the Warleys are typically done as a outdoor mural paintings on the walls of, of the hearts where they are plastered with mud. So it's, it's very rough. And um, this uh, rough terrain, what it does to me is uh, creates the shadow of its own. And then I also use a lot of different kinds of texture, like sometimes, like mixture. Somewhere there would be a very highly gloss texture, satin, matte. And um, this also helps to bring different color shades and within the same color out. Uh, here I have used brown, but along with the brown, there is a lot of different uh, shades of same brown. So I have ochre to raw to uh, burn sienna, even the hints of black, brown and red within the paint. Now the paints are taken depending upon what, how the, the texture was laid down. So where there's satin and gloss, you see more yellowish because the color didn't uh, took, uh, it wasn't uh, heavily applied to the base. So it creates that effect and then I paint with white acrylic paint. Now the, the the interesting thing about this process is the depending upon how light hits the piece, it will look different. Like sometimes during the, just because it has so many, um, you know, different um, texture or terrain within the, the canvas itself, it has its own shadows and it does things uh, on its own. So the depending upon how light hits, it becomes totally dark brown or black on white. And if it is like the light is hitting right on it, it would be a multicolored and white paint. And I think that is such an interesting and creates that very unique piece that even I can recreate it because I can't go <laughs> back and put all those structures again. But I think it's, it's a very interesting way to bring color. And um, being monotonal, I think the stories are so colorful it gives you a chance to not get distracted and focus on the story. Your attention 
your vision goes towards the, the painting. This painting is called Summer Fun. And um, you can, when I was a little girl, I was told when, I, when you see sun, moon and star together, it's time to eat your supper and go to bed. And you can see here, there is sun, moon and star together. So it is an evening scene. And it is all the fun activities you see during summer in the evening, there is an outdoor concert, there's dance because I like dancing, but, but there is a barbecues happening, picnics happening, catching fish, swimming in the pond. You know, there is, um, again, there, there is a campfire. It's, it's happy and everything that goes around the evening, but it is, it helps you take, see the stories. It helps you connect and, uh, give an opportunity for you to put yourself in the painting and start connecting yourself with it through this piece. Um, whereas um, similar uh, way, the way I uh, bring color to my colorful piece is a little bit different. So the way I apply gouache is same as you will paint underpainting and overpainting. Here we can, uh, this is a good example for that. Um, I pre-treat my paper lightly with coffee and to bring that natural earthy tone to my paper. It's a handmade paper. It helps me bring, you know, enhance the texture a little bit and uh, creates that subtle tones of brown, which I can't, you can't create on your own, like, you know, unexpected tone quality to it. Um, the, and then I paint with wash, so it is applied as a second layer of paint, just like in acrylics and oils. And that helps me bring the painting up. It also makes wash a little bit more vibrant and intense than it would naturally appear. And I don't, uh, you can't see much, but like all my painting has a little bit of exposed paper. Either they are branches or leaves, and that's where that brown earthy tone from coffee comes in play where you can, um, you know, see that light, different shades of brown and, you know, unexpected lines through uh, within the painting. Yeah. Awesome. We are um, going to probably just do a couple more questions that I had originally um, laid out for you um, mm -hmm. because I want to save some time at the end for folks' questions. Um, but this... That. Yeah, this is an experience event. So um, I didn't mention at the beginning, but to um, for students to get experience credit, they do have to do two polls um, for us. So um, as soon as we finish um, the last couple of official questions, we'll release our first poll. Um, and then we'll open this up to audience questions. And then at the end of that, we'll have our second and final poll uh, at the end of the session. Um, but let me move on with a couple of questions that I want to get to for sure. Um, so one of the things that you um, did talk about earlier with the monkeys was how important that family is um, as an influence on your creative process. Are there other um, aspects of the, the works that we've seen today that you could um, really pinpoint where family comes through strongly in your work? Sure, um, you know, most of my paintings, central motive, some way or other way, it's all about family. And, uh, you know, there's a Sanskrit uh, phrase, very famous, it's called Vasudevam Kutambakam. That means uh, a world is one family. And that's, that is um, somewhere uh, inspires all the paintings. And here you can see, uh, Koi, you can see a family gathering, like all the Koi's are coming together. And again, it's it's all about coming together and living harmoniously. The other painting you saw was the summer fun. And it was, it was initially, the, the painting was inspired by summer of 2018 and everything we did um, with my family. And the last one was, um, again, this is where the Warley comes in play for me. And it is my uh, son who is at that time, six year old told me that um, why I don't paint spiders ever in my painting. And I'm like, you know what? Yes, of course it's summer, there's spider. And I, I don't know if you can see through, but the, the tree on the left, 
has a spider web and spider is hanging. And then, uh, you know, um, he told me we bought a tire swing and I'm like, yes, we have to add that. And, you know, the Warley is all about uh, the women's painting together. And like, oftentimes I'll start with a subject and, you know, my, you know, my parents will say something, oh, we did that. It's like, yeah, you know, I'll add that. And, you know, you, we did that. And my kids will say something and it, it's about the community. It is, I feel like the happiness and joy is because we are together. Like somehow it influences our life. Every small and big thing influences our life. And you can see that even the, the um, Blue Jays called Do It is, is the same thing. It's like a couple coming together. And, uh, you know, it's, it's yes, it is, it is all about family and, to me, that's what brings the most joy. And you will see that repeating uh, inner feelings throughout my all my paintings. Beautiful. Yeah. I'm gonna stop sharing this so we can come back and, and see you a bit more and we'll <laughs> see some of your work back behind sure. you there too. So, so my last official question is looking at these, um, even with my untrained eye, I can see that they um, are very detailed. And so one question I'm curious about is how much time do you put into each of these works? Because it looks like it must be hours and hours. That is a fantastic question. And I think one of the most asked questions to me is how much time does it take to create? Um, to be honest, um, David, for me, the, the longest time is conception. I start thinking and writing about the subjects, you know, not sure how long, like sometimes it is two, three years, sometimes, because I don't create subject or a study piece. For me, it has to be visually ready in my head. And then I paint, like once I'm thoroughly ready with it, that's when I paint. And it is uh, challenging and experimental and intriguing at the same time. Like for me, like I have end result in mind and I'm trying to navigate through it. So it's, it's, it's exciting time for me. So the, the painting that we have here, um, the one that's called uh, April Shower, it has been, uh, I don't know, maybe a couple of years. I think we moved in this particular house in 2019 and we have a dwarf cherry tree and that's what the, the tree is. And, you know, I often, it's uh, outside my kitchen. I have my coffee and I see it and I loved it. And I wanted to paint that rain and that tree. And it, and from there it started to paint a season and it, it was in 19. It took me about two years to actually conceptualize the piece. And after that, it was it was a couple of weeks. Like actual painting time is so much lesser, but to conceptualize piece is oftentimes a lot, lot longer than you expect. And this is the sister piece you see here. It's called Fall, Falling in Love with Fall. So it's it's a two season. And I just finished that. So it takes. Um, actual painting times is so much lesser than conceptualizing. And I think that's where um, the time goes in because I want it to be uh, very specific to bring that colors and essence through those paintings is where the time uh, commitment is. That makes sense. Thinking about it and just, yeah, yes. all yes. the ideals and yes. bringing it together. Really, yes. really powerful. So um, we have a question here from one of our faculty members in the art department. Uh, this is Kristen Woodward, who um, teaches painting and printmaking. She says, thanks for sharing your wonderful paintings with us. Um, I enjoyed hearing about your connection to past processes and traditions. Um, but I am wondering if your paintings also contain contemporary issues about landscapes and ecology. Um, I do read a lot about when I'm painting birds and animals, I do think, uh, read about them in depth. So to understand um, their connection, their behavioral patterns. 
And so far as landscape is concerned, I do, and that's where the conceptualizing comes in play. Like I conceptualize um, the keys ahead of time and that's where the time takes place. Uh, you know, the, the process is to think and make it look balanced and harmonious um, landscapes within the painting. Doesn't matter if it is uh, war, the animals or birds or warley. Barley. It is to conceptualize that uh, environment, which I call, you know, it can be taken as a landscape to create those pieces. I I would imagine knowing Kristen and her work as well, she's also very uh, conscientious of environmental concerns and some of those things. So I, I suspect she's what she's really getting at here is, you know, are those some of the same concerns that you share? And did those come out in your in your creative practice or are those things that really are not part of what you're addressing in your work? Well, it is, it is in some ways, right? Because um, I do love nature and that's, and would love to preserve that. And I, I'm sharing these pieces out to people and make them excited and hopefully they will see the issues and try to preserve them as well. So uh, that's why all the paintings are nature inspired and has nature element to it. Great. Um, again, folks can um, post those questions. I'm gonna ask a question that I did not get to earlier. Um, but I did kind of reference this because I mentioned and we showed some very um, uh, detailed shots um, where you have those beautiful patterns and um, Shilpi kind of mentioned how um, in the, the Worley style that they're not necessarily indicative of, um, you know, like illustrating what an actual flower would be like. It's the reference of the flower um, with the five petals, things like that. But my question is really how important is in the creative process is the repetition of those patterns that you've created. Um, I just was thinking with your scientific background about things like fractals and, and so forth. And, and your paintings really lend itself in some ways to, to that very scientific aspect. And so I'm, I'm curious about that as well. Well, I, I haven't thought of that in, in that respect, but I feel like to me, those repetitions of flowers is my observation of nature. And I see, you know, the trees full of leaves and trees full of flowers. And that's what I'm trying, the essence is where the reputation and um, the same uh, reputation comes in place. And uh, also, if you see those, um, especially Kalamkari pieces, you will see that reputation of same patterns because it was uh, utilized to create the textile printing. So it's the same block printed again and again and again. And uh, I use those flower to create that busy environment. But that, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got another question here from one of our students, I believe. Um, this is Kennedy Green. She says, I know you mentioned uh, how much thought and effort goes into the meaning and intention behind your artwork. That being said, do you ever experience any type of block, like mental block on um, creative block, since your pieces are so closely connected to your own personal life? And if so, how do you work through that? Oh, that is a great question. Yes, I oftentimes uh, struggle with them. And I have, so I, instead of creating a study piece, I have a book bed and I just keep writing. Oftentimes it's, it's just the gibberish. So the book will title as April Shower and I just keep writing those points to clear my head. And sometimes even the coming up with the subject becomes an issue. And that those are the times I have a giant wall in my living room, which I can see throughout my house. And I do hang that empty canvas or paper there oh, wow. just so that I, hoping that that paper will speak to me, that canvas will speak to me and ask me that, yes, you need to do this. And uh, I think that is a part of creative process. And it's, it, it is, natural to be blocked. If you're not blocked, I think there's some, some issues right there. But yes, I do uh, often struggle with that. And that's, that is another reason why it takes me a couple of years to conceptualize a piece before I actually 
create them. And I have a number of books that I just are with the subjects and all I do is just write. I even if I go back and read them, it might not make any sense to me because it was it was a momentarily thought, but that helps me keep thinking and keep improving. Sometimes something else comes out of it, and sometimes it's just the continuation of those thoughts, which will one day will lead a painting. I think that's really interesting, and I, I also find it interesting that kind of the the blank canvas like can serve as an inspiration for you. Um, I I would consider myself more of a writer. I I, I imagine Shilpi does as well. Right. And, and probably one of the the things that's the scariest is facing a blank page. I I don't know if you agree <laughs> with me, um, but that that seems pretty daunting. Um, but it does actually um, beg another question. And uh, one of the things that I'm I'm curious about. I know many artists. Um, will often have multiple um, works going at the same time and they'll come back to a work and mm -hmm. work on it. Is that part of um, how you create as well or do you just work on one thing at a time? No, no. so um, as I said before, like I create the whole piece in my head. So the piece is ready to the point it has already been framed and it's hanging in its natural environment. That means in somebody's house. That is the actual time I paint. I do not start in between because I feel like I'm one of those kids who can get lost, easily lost in candy store. And I do often do that. So um, for me, the, the easiest way I can describe the process is um, once it is ready in my head, it is basically a cut, copy and paste process. Like I know, which pink I'm using, like I'm using rose or paddle or, you know, it's, it's burnt red. Everything is completely ready for me to paint. And that's why once I'm painting, I'm painting, I do not want to get distracted and, and use another piece. I only piece one big, I'm sorry, one piece at a time. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. Um, we have another question. Uh, this is from Sandra uh, Engel. Um, she says, the details are so delicate. Do you incorporate drawing or are the pieces all created with paint and brushes? Um, that is a great question. Um, they're all prehand. So once the painting is ready, I place my subject in like in one of the cases you saw was the, the blue jay. So I pl loosely place them. And from then on, it's all brush strokes. And I start with black paint. And the another reason to that is so that I don't get distracted. It is done, it is done. I can't go back and change. And I need that focus on working. So I don't work on two pieces. So it's 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 a dedication to that piece. And it's again, it is exciting and scary at the same time. And I want to be there. Yeah. And it's it just speaks to how much of an investment. Um, each of these pieces really are uh, that you know the time that it takes to conceive of them, but then also to complete them as well. Um, we have uh, one other question that we can get to, and then I think we'll do our last poll. Uh, this is from it looks like an anonymous attendee. Um, it says, "What was your favorite piece um, in the show, piece of artwork uh, to make, and what was your inspiration for creating it?" Oh wow. Um... Oh boy, <laughs> that is a hard question. Well, I, I'm certainly very close to the piece home. And uh, the I started thinking about that piece, I, I believe back in 2019. And the tree is inspired by um, the realistic tree called Word. And it's a bunion tree. And the hometown that I grew up in is called Bunion Tree Town. Literally every crossroad we have bunion tree. And that's why the town is called Bunyan Tree. Um, and the kids, and it was certainly an emotional investment for me at this piece. Um, and the another favorite of mine in this show is called Sunrise. And I thought it, I was able to create such a deep, I was able to put um, such a deep feeling of mine 
successfully on the canvas. And I, um, I really love that piece. The, the piece in person looks so live. Um, and um, yeah, so those are my two absolute favorite pieces. I might put Shelby on the spot um, and yes. ask her that question too. <laughs> yeah, I would love to know. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like the flamingo piece just because of the contrast between the pink and the green yes. and sort of the realism that's captured with the flamingo and even like this, these details of the leaves, which are, um, you know, these wispy sort of leaves with some, with some, you know, very small flowers. So that contrast really um, really works really well. And, um, and you have that sense of pattern, but then you have this, you know, really big image of the bird. So, um, and I love the colors in this piece. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is certainly a very playful piece. Yeah. Sure. And, and your summertime piece, of course, the way you describe it, that piece is just, um, just so evocative of all the pleasures of summer. So that's also a wonderful piece. Yeah, this piece. Yeah, it go. has a certain moment. The flamingo has a certain moment to itself. They are all beautiful, I will say. I just want to thank again, um, both uh, Renal for sharing this beautiful, beautiful, amazing work um, and all the, the thoughts and, and processes that go into creating these um, really unique and wonderful, uh, very personal uh, works of art. And um, also I want to thank uh, Shelby for sharing her insights both today um, as well as in the trifold. And again, if you haven't gotten one of these, definitely get out there and get it. I think I am blurring it so you can't really <laughs> see it. Sorry. Um, but those are available for you. They're free. And we thank you so much for joining us today. I will let our guests go uh, with our gratitude. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.